Hello everybody, this is Dr. Novak again. This is the second part of me explaining the nitrogen cycle. And if you watch part one, or the first part of me explaining the nitrogen cycle, you probably learned right away that there are three types of oxygen requirements for bacteria. Okay, we're not talking about anaerobic bacteria because they don't require any oxygen. We're talking about the oxygen requirements for bacteria that we use in our aquariums. That is never talked about. We know that obligated anaerobes are oxygen required, as I explain. This, if a light didn't go off in your head on this one, this is exactly how the wet dry filter came about. I think it was the Germans who came up with the idea of the wet dry filter and that filter only catered to one class of bacteria, obligated anaerobes, oxygen required, high oxygen required anaerobes. And we found out that these filters, as good as they were, okay, all they did was take ammonia and convert it into nitrates and no further. They did a very good job of it. In fact, they can convert ammonia 30 times faster than inside the aquarium these filters did. If you're not familiar with these filters, maybe you may want to Google and find out just exactly how the wet-dry filter came about, how it was very popular in the 80s, and it was, it was like a new wonder filter. And everybody and their brother was making them and, and uh, putting them out there for sale. Even Eheim made a whole aquarium system with a wet-dry filter. Everybody was making them. Everybody was selling them. But what they did is only took the nitrogen cycle and only used two bacteria. Nitrosomatous bacteria of course, and nitrosporia bacteria, which we all know have, if you watch my last video, it, we all know that they have freshwater and saltwater bacteria for both those environments. But we know that that's all it used. It didn't cater to the other two types of oxygen requiring bacteria at all. And if the aquarium itself didn't cater to the other two types of oxygen required bacteria, then the system just made nitrates and it made more nitrates. And that's why people start hating it is because uh, looking for a simulation of plants to take care of nitrates. Well, what if you don't have plants? Or what if you have a saltwater aquarium that doesn't have plants? You got a problem. All you do is have a nitrate, nitrate producer, and you have no users for that nitrate. So you're not completing the nitrogen cycle like a freshwater system would or a saltwater system would. Okay? So you probably learned that through the first video. And in this video, I'm going to show you uh, some of the things that I have written, they're, they're very old. In fact, uh, what I have written here is uh, over, it was uh, called A Splash of Life, Dr. Novak's Corner. And that was uh, came out in over 20 years ago. So what I am teaching you is nothing new. It's been out for years and years and years and years. Decades. But why are we still getting it wrong? We're getting it wrong because people still are sticking to the old ways of doing things instead of trying to come up with the right ways of doing things. And we're not changing. We're not progressing. Manufacturers are trying very hard. But we as hobbyists... Uh, we are not trying very hard to open up our minds. As you can see by the 
first photograph, this is a BCB basket that you're looking at. And this BCB basket that you're looking at is one of my drawings out of my book. And as you can see, if you look at the basket, the BCB basket, it shows you the negative charges inside and it shows the positive charges along with negative charges on the outside of the basket. The basket attracts the ions into it and this then completes a nitrogen cycle of obligated aerobes. It also completes a cycle with facultative bacteria which are present in the absence of oxygen or with oxygen. Uh, microphilic bacteria grow best in very low levels of oxygen and aerial to tolerant uh, anaerobes. Oxygen is not required for the growth but not harmful if present. Okay, that's what the basket does. That is what we are trying to achieve with our plenum. The same outcome by using all the different oxygen levels and all the bacteria that's available in our arsenal. Not just one type or one kind of bacteria. And then from there, it just makes a waste product that can't be used. You should have gotten this all out of my first uh, video. So on this video, now since we understand that a lot better of what we're trying to achieve, I'm going to take you through the different methods of setting up different kinds of systems that are used and their names. Okay, the first one we're going to talk about is the deep sand sand bed system or the mud system. This looks kind of probably familiar to everybody because this is exactly what some YouTube videos are about. A deep sand bed of at least four inches of uh, mud, sand, or whatever. This is also used in saltwater systems. And as you can see, the atmosphere is a uh, uh, negative charge. And the aquarium is basically positively charged. And as you can see, the fine coral sand within fauna in it uh, is negatively charged. Now, uh, fauna and in fauna in the mud system was, this was to keep it open. So uh, water and oxygen could get into the system. And what it is is uh, hydrogen sulfide in the lower layer, layers of the sand bed but will not migrate up or reach toxic levels if infauna will turn over sediment volumes every three to 30 days. Okay, so in other words, the, the bed itself has to be turned over constantly. And this was done by uh, the fauna or infauna that is in that deep sand bed filter. And if you put this to fresh water, it would be that you're trying to use plants. And as I've said before, plants are too unreliable. Uh, one person advocates that you use over 70% of the bed to be plants or rooted plants in this bed to help try to keep it open. If you have a reliable oxygen supply to the plants, plants cannot live without oxygen. They need oxygen and they're unreliable as far as trying to bring oxygen into the root systems and therefore these systems do have their problems with hydrogen sulfide. If in a saltwater aquarium when these were used they would use the fauna or in fauna to uh, keep the bed open constantly. So water would easily migrate inside the filter itself or your sand bed. This doesn't seem to be advocated anymore. It seems to be dead now. It must have had its 
problems with the saltwater hobbyists and apparently it was just too unreliable or it just created too much nitrites and phosphates and caused all kinds of algae problems. So this kind of went by the wayside, but it's still used in theory for fresh water today as long as you have adequate plant life to keep the sand bed open. The next system we are going to talk about now is the exothermic system. Now remember, these are just drawings I did um, over 20 years ago. And then I had to redraw them. And this particular system here is, it was advocated once again, this was a German idea. Once again, you have your, uh, your heating cables. And this is called an exothermic system. And this is a convection system or percolation system. Okay. And I've talked about this in my videos. These systems uh, use heated cables. They would heat up the substrate and then turn over the water volume from cooler, cooler water that is in the main aquarium from the water uh, that is in the sand bed itself that would heat up and warm up and it would do the exchange of convection or percolation. This is done by heat. It's a great idea if you think about it. Same thing that they use in uh, greenhouses. You warm the bottom of the soil up and uh, the plants will grow better. They like the roots to be warm. Oxygen and warmth is what plants want. The whole idea is, is great. It works the same way. As you can see, you have your negative and positive charges. The problem is the unreliability of the heating cables. The next problem is the unreliability of the environment of which they're heating up. In other words, the external environment, the environment in which the room plays a part. So in the summertime, when rooms are warmer up to 75, 78 degrees, the heating cables never go on. And what I have found out is the worst thing that starts happening is like in the deep sand bed, hydrogen sulfide, blackening of the substrate underneath where the heating cables are. You can see the substrate already turning black because they're not turning on. They're not turning over the water. And basically, if they don't turn on, you have a deep sand bed system. Even, and I even saw this with plant roots and everything in there because you could see the plant roots going all the way through, touching the bottom of the glass, and they were white and everything was going great. And once the heating cables didn't work anymore, or if they break, you can see all of a sudden the blackening of the root, the blackening of the soil at the very bottom of the glass. And this did not work out very good because the unreliability of the heating cables. They're just too unreliable. We all know this because we all have uh, heaters and we know they always fail. Within a short period of time, they actually become useless or we have to buy a new heater or we have to buy a new controller for the heater. So the heating cable, it was it's a great idea. I will admit it. If it's working, you know, 12 months out of the year. But I guess if you, you know, don't live in Alaska, it, it's not going to perform for everybody everywhere. And that's where I found the downside of the heating cable method. The next method on our agenda of different filtration systems was the Berlin system. Okay, the Berlin system used something just a, a, a little different than the other systems, but uh, it too had its problems. And Basically, if you think about it, the Berlin system is what a lot of people use today. But that is the system what it's called. Uh, 
it was a shallower bed, 0.5 to 1 inch of coarse coral sand. If you think about it, when people do planet tanks, they lay it directly on the bottom, just like this Berlin system. That's what it's called, a Berlin system. But look at the charges of the whole system. You got positive ions in the water column. The bed itself is positive. Okay, you have two positive charges. You're not attracting ions in the bed. You see what the problem is here? Where in the other beds, if you have a positive charge, you have a negative charge, you're going to attract ions and you're going to encourage water movement. As you can see, you have the negative ions on top of the aquarium, water, positive ions. The bed itself is positive. I don't know how to explain this any better to you than this is why a lot of people fail by just throwing their substrate at the bottom. The diagram shows it. The, the bacteria of which you are growing in here has to be a bacteria that is going to be uh, aerial tol tolerant anaerobes. And these anaerobes that we are catering to is uh, oxidant required for growth, but not harmful if present. In other words, no oxygen. Oxygen is not required for growth. Okay. But if oxygen does come to them, okay, it will not harm them. The problem is you have a positive substrate with a positive water column. So you're not attracting the ions like you want. Think about what I'm just saying here. That explains to you why you constantly have to feed your aquarium. Now, if you move this over to a freshwater system, it works the same way. There's nothing different whether it's salt water or fresh water. It works the same way. You have a positive substrate. You have positive ions in the water column. You're not moving ions in and out freely. And therefore, you come up with problems of why you constantly have to inoculate your system with all kinds of... Uh, uh, chemicals as far as your fertilizers and things like this unless you really have aggressive growing plants to help try to get oxygen into the substrate okay but you don't have that electrical charge so you have de defeated the purpose of moving ions in and out freely here it is right here you don't have that charge in such a system this is how the Berlin system works. It's still kind of, it's used today. You don't really hear people call it a Berlin system, but that is what it is. But this, these are the charges. This, these are what we found out. The charges of the substrate and the charges of the aquarium are the same. And this would then account for why some hobbyists fail and some maybe will succeed, depending on, of course, the substrate of which they're using and how much oxygen can get in there. And can it complete the complete nitrogen cycle? In most cases, no. You end up with nothing but nitrates and phosphates and therefore water changes have to be done or aggressive gro growing plants can knock the nitrates and phosphates down but that means you're going to have to be using CO2. You're going to have to be doing everything exactly right, according to the way the picture shows. The last system is the Jobert Plenum. Jobert was a professor in France, and uh, there's very little written, very little written about the Jobert Plenum. And... If you look at the graph of this Jobert plenum, it looks quite like the plenum that we are doing for our freshwater aquariums, isn't it? 
But like I said, there's very little written from this professor on this. Uh, it could be one or two lines. I know there was so little written about it that most people never knew about it. And he came up with this plenum system, as you can see here, and you have your negative charges in the atmosphere, you have your positive charges in the aquarium, which we know, you know, this goes for salt water and fresh water. Okay, remember, I'm talking about both. And then you have your fine coral sand, which uh, oxidation layer, it's called. And then you have your reduction layer, see, uh, which is your anoxic zone. And then you have uh, your screen or your plenum. Now, as you can see, the plenum, as I tell you, make it one inch. You don't need to make it an uh, inch and a half, but one inch is good enough. As you see, the plenum, the water in the plenum is negative and positive charged. As you see, the plenum itself, the, the layers that we make, and I have told you how to make them in my other previous videos, as you can see, the substrate is negatively charged. Okay, and the aquarium is positively charged, which means we all know we had played with magnets. Uh, endothermic chemical reaction system is what this is called. Okay, you guys asked for it, so th this is what it is. So if anyone asks you what you're doing in your fish tank, you could say I'm using an endothermic chemical reaction system. That would be the technical name of what you are doing to your freshwater aquariums. And then everyone's just going to look at you all glassy-eyed, like, what did you just say? But that is what it really is. So what we do is we have several things working in our favor. We, one, have ions moving in and out of the substrate. Remember the biosinosis basket that I showed you in the very beginning. So what you're trying to do is create the same thing in your aquarium. You're trying to move positive ions into a negative ion substrate. What happens when you have positive and what happens when you have negative? They attract to each other. They don't repel each other because you've had two positive or two negatives, right? We all played with magnets. It would repel. In this case, what we're trying to do is get positive attracted to negative. This makes water movement. Okay, this makes a chemical reaction. You understand? You need, the, the deeper the substrate, at least three to four inches, the better it works. Sometimes people, they may have a little bit of problem, and I'll say, well, how deep's your substrate? Well, it's not deep enough. I say, you may have to add more substrate. Now, of course, if you look at this, you got at least uh an inch to uh, 0.5 inches, you get maybe have an inch or you have a half an inch that you will ma make your plenum. And then from there you would build up your substrate. But if you look how much substrate you're going to need, you're going to need at least three to four inches of substrate. You can go less, but it may uh, not work as well. Remember, I've always said good, better, best. That's why when I did my aquarium, I did it exactly at least three inches above the plenum itself. At least three inches. And as you know, if you watched my last video, you saw that I'm not having a phosphate problem, I'm not having a nitrate problem. It's because of the reduction layer and you have an oxidation layer. Okay, you remember my last video, I explained to you about the different oxygen requirements to finish the nitrogen cycle. Okay, the three types. This does it. This allows you to have all three oxygen layers where you have the oxidation layer, which will break down ammonia into nitrites, nitrites into nitrates. But because you have this movement you will have a reduction layer. And the reduction layer becomes an anoxic layer, you understand. And that's when you have, 
what I explained to you in my last video, you will either have an assimilatory denitrification or dissimilative denitrification. And that layer, the reduction layer, you will have dissimilative denitrification turning any nitrates into nitrogen gas and the bacteria will make better use of phosphorus and only make trace amounts of phosphates if you remember my last video. Well here's a picture trying to showing you exactly what happens. Now you add plants to that but plants are not a necessity of that. They are luxury. What I found out from the Chaubert plenum is the slow moving plenum. We had it right, as I've said lots of times, in the very beginning. We used to put three, four inches of substrate, and we had these little bubblers, and they had uh, a little 3 h tube, and it all changed. We started getting to the point where we wanted faster and faster and faster. And what we created was exactly the wet dry filter. We got more and more oxygen going through the layers of substrate to the point all we were doing is making nitrates as an end product. We lost control of the whole system and we were not finishing the nitrogen cycle as it was being done back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. We had it right to begin with. When I started doing the research on this, I found that the plenum that you're looking at here is great, but the slow moving plenum by adding a little tube, slowing it down, one lift tube, you don't need four or five, you don't need power heads. We found out that by moving it slowly, you keep these ions moving through uh, diffusion or through convection or through you know because this is a chemical reaction system and you are constantly moving water through it and oxygen then becomes depleted as it goes into the oxidation layer and then it goes into the reduction layer where oxygen levels are very low. But remember, these, this, this oxygen uh, reduction layer is great for plants. Plants want oxygen, but they don't want high amounts of oxygen. We found this out years and years ago by uh, having under gravel filters. We ran them real fast and people tried to make a planted aquarium. And what happened to the planted aquarium? It didn't work out. And what we found out is we were giving too much oxygen to the root systems of the plants. And therefore, people then started making undergravel filters where the plates were only on half the aquarium and the other half of the aquarium would have the plants. Because once again, we didn't understand the science behind it. What was going on? And eventually that uh, developed into get rid of the plates altogether. And now you only have the Berlin system that people are using. Instead of staying, staying, staying with this uh, Schaubert plenum, and like I've said before, I did not invent the undergravel filter. I do not advocate it. I did not invent the plenum. I just improved upon it, you know, uh, I remember a long time ago as a child, I used to watch uh, Monsanto, and Monsanto used to uh, uh, have a program on, and they would have advertisement, and they said, we didn't invent the ketchup bottle, we just made and improved it so the ketchup would come out better. You know, they would even say, we didn't invent it, but the people who invented it would send it to us, and we just made it better. And that's what I did. I didn't invent the plenum, but through my studies and research, I improved upon it to work better than it originally was set up as you look at this uh, drawing here. It now is improved. Before it was thought that if you did move water through the plenum, it would 
hurt the whole system, and that was not the case. Not through all the testing I did with electrical charges and found out that, yes, you still had the negative charges, you still have the positive and negative charges in the plenum, you still have a high redox. In fact, you have a higher redox if you move the water very slowly through there. And like, like it says, nitrates down to zero. Other nutrients remain extremely low. Uh, more efficient than any other form of filtration. I was writing this and doing this and teaching this over 20 plus years ago. Okay, so this is, this is not new. None of, the, none of what I'm telling you is new. But for some reason, hobbyists have resisted adamantly to do this because it's probably easier, easier just to do the Berlin system throw the substrate at the bottom but as you see with the berlin system you just have a positive charge substrate and you have a positively charged ions in the water column and if you can't move okay what's in the water column into the substrate somehow some way through plants or something else you're going to have a failed system you're not moving ions okay it gets difficult, I understand, really. I mean, uh, it, it just gets more and more complicated as we go along. But this is how natural systems work. And we are trying to mimic it, is all we're trying to do. We're trying to do what Mother Nature has done for millions and millions of years inside a little bitty container that's uh, 24 by 30 inches okay whatever your size container but it works it does work and sometimes if people don't set it up right which i have often said using the biosynosis clarification baskets is that if people don't set them up right and believe me i had people come up set them up wrong with the wrong kitty litter they use uh, kitty litter that had fragrance in them and stuff like that we're wiping out their complete ponds and everything else but if you understand the science then a light bulb will click in your head and you'll say, holy cow, why weren't we told this? What is the big secret? This guy's been talking about this for decades. Why did we steer away from it? And I myself can't really explain to you what happened in the hobby why everybody steered away from it were they making it wrong did they did they feel it was too costly it was too time consuming it uh yeah, the sand was the sand bed or your or your or your substrate bed is uh is too deep and they didn't like it so let me get off my soapbox there and i basically you understand this photograph right here is a photograph of a 800 gallon pond and this is using an anoxic filter I think on this pond I was using 20 of the BCB baskets and look at the size of the koi inside this pond some of the koi were 25 29 inches 25 inches 24 inches 30 inches long a Benny Goy was 30 inches long you can imagine that if you had a 800 gallon pond with this many fish and as huge as these fish are and living as long as they can inside a small environment like this using an anoxic filter. That's how powerful an anoxic filter is. The next photographs I'm going to show you, sorry about the quality, but these are pictures that I took from old photographs uh, th this aquarium when I first doing experiments this is to show you remember I said a jungle aquarium well this is exactly what I was talking about and if you look at these photographs which are very old if you look on I, I don't know if you can see very good there's a cryptochorine on the left hand side and that thing is stretching up over a foot long and you can see the cryptochorine in the front how it's filling in how 
all the plants have filled in. It looks like a jungle aquarium. This was a big aquarium, people. This is a huge aquarium, but, but look at how full this aquarium got by using a slow-moving plenum. And, of course, I did use uh, CL2. The uh, CL2 was injected uh, pretty much as uh, much as you could, 30 parts per million. It was probably a little less than that. But this is this to show you, and I warned you, that if you use a system like this, this could pretty much... What, what can happen is you can end up with a jungle tank like this. The Amazon swords in the back just outgrew the tank, literally grew up to the top. This tank has to be at least 20 inches tall. They grew up, the leaves were bending over. So these plants were well over 24 plus inches long, the Amazon swords. They all grew up in this aquarium, and this was done uh, 20 plus years ago, 25 maybe years ago, I was achieving unbelievable aquariums like this. And they literally just turn into jungle tanks because you're giving the plants everything they need and what they need. And it was a beautiful aquarium, just like you would see in the pictures, but it did uh, get kind of out of hand with the plants. So I did want to show you that uh, this is what can happen in your aquarium when you plant it up using a plenum system as I have explained to you in my videos. Okay I'm going to cut this video short here. There's a lot more to be said, a lot more I have to show you, but I've already eaten up at least you know 35 minutes of your time and uh, I want to thank you for watching. I will have to go to another part of this to help explain some other things like I said it gets more involved I know there are uh, oh, there are new words that probably you never heard of like uh, endothermic chemical reactions uh, things like this these are things I did try to stay away from but hey you asked me to do this so I'm doing it but I hope the video was uh, enlightening to it. I hope it helped the first video explain a few things. And I hope you finish watching my other videos. I will explain more and get into some more detail. Uh, for those who are bored, I'm probably not going to get that many views because of that. But anyway, thank you for watching once again. This is Dr. Novak and uh, happy fish keeping.